things are gonna get crazy. <laughs> Most everyone's mad. <laughs> well, 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 if it isn't my beautiful watchers and listeners, welcome back everybody to Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend because I certainly have. And not to mention the fact that I did had a pretty good sleep, so I've gathered up and stored a good amount of energy and unloaded all here for today's episode. And may I add, by the way, that for the episode that we are about to get into, we shall be looking into the future. And I know that a lot of it is about talking about recent news, about upcoming projects, but what I mean specifically is that some of these stories will be looking into the long-term impact of how we will be consuming our entertainment. And there's going to be a lot of them that I do believe will be worth discussing right over here. So, with that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, are you all prepared for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Let me go in here and folks, are you ready? Uh, let's see now. All right. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. I see some people are all prepared. Some people are all set. Uh, a few are using my, uh, em my emotes, so that's nice. Okay, so, with all that said and done, it is now time that we shall go and get this one started! And with our first story that we shall be looking into, we shall go and take a look at the biggest trailer of last week. Now, you might probably know which one that I am referring to, and some of you might be a little bit confused as to why I would be talking about that one, because technically, well, that's not an animated film, isn't it? Well, technically, no. But I mean, with all the amount of uh, special effects that is being used, the fact that it's so CG heavy and the grand majority of the entire franchise is littered with just a whole bunch of CG and visual effects, it might as well be considered animated in a way. So, with that said and none, let's go ahead and start this off by looking into the trailer of one of the most anticipated movies at the end of the year, which is none other than then the Matrix Resurrections. Thomas, you seem particularly triggered right now. Can you tell me what happened? I've had dreams that weren't just dreams. Am I crazy? We don't use that word in here. Still here. I know it's why you're still fighting and why you will never give up. You don't know me. No?
after all these years, to be going back to where it all started. Back to the Matrix. And that was indeed The Matrix Resurrections, the comeback of the beloved franchise and the fourth installment of the Matrix movies, which is going to be coming soon this holiday season on December 22nd in both theaters and on HBO Max. And one thing I just need to go and start things off right off the bat is just by saying that I find it funny that this trailer really does emphasize the Alice allegory because the thing with the Matrix movies and especially with the first Matrix in general is that it's one of those movies that has often and has been heavily analyzed. It's like whenever you would go into a film school, there there's bound to be at least that one moment in your class where you have to watch the Matrix and you have to go and heavily analyze it. I remember back in my college days i've probably seen the matrix once or twice for the case of uh uh, studying it and actually look into some of the allegories and stuff like that and i'm sure throughout the entire time that it's been studied and and stuff like that like you might even find some video essays on youtube where there are some people that would go and make those comparisons between the matrix and alice in wonderland uh but the funny thing is is that in this case right over here not only do they really get into to that allegory, not just with the song throughout the entire trailer, but uh, it looks like there's going to be one new character that fully embraces Alice, like even having uh, tattoos of uh, of like the rabbit uh, of the rabbits and uh, like playing cards and stuff like that. Pretty much Alice references. And then like as well as that same woman, even like there's that one shot that actually has um, Alice's adventures in Wonderland or I, I think it's actually both. Uh, like it's, it's, it's a both, it's a book from Lewis Carroll. It's either, um, it it is either like a combination of the two or, uh, according to the, uh, cover, it does say it's from through, through the looking glass. So either way, um, the point that I want to make is that this really does emphasize heavily the Alice allegory. And I just find it funny that now they're just fully embracing that aspect. And also, uh, like, even though I just wanted to get that out of the way, one thing I should have started this off is just um, my personal relationship with the Matrix movies. And I will say that I find them to be fine. Like, I'm not one of those people that's like really crazy into the Matrix or a full on Matrix fanboy. Like, I understand why people love it so much and I understand its massive impact in cinema, especially regarding its visuals, rather it be the cinematography or if it's from the uh, from the special effects or if it's from the directing of the Wachowski sisters. Like, I do understand why it has a fandom and why it is so beloved to this day, especially with the world building, the story, and all the action that it entails in there. But for me, it's just one of those franchises like, yeah, I see it. I respect it. But it's not necessarily something that I would jump into and really go crazy for. So it's like, for for me, it's one of those franchises that... Yeah, it's there. I understand it. I respect it. But it's not one of those that immediately attracts me. It's it's more of a, a personal taste more than anything. I mean, like, I, I'm more of an animation guy. It's not it, it, it's nothing against the Matrix I- itself. It's just that my interests are more elsewhere but i do understand it and i do respect it and like there's a lot of things that are to be admired uh especially when the original matrix movies are actually an allegory in terms of uh transitioning uh when you are a transgender like it's kind of the uh like in a funny way when it comes to the wachowski uh, wachowski sisters uh they actually made the matrix movies uh like without even probably without even knowing or maybe psychologically knowing that they wanted to go they wanted to go and do a transition when they were making uh, the matrix movies which nowadays kind of makes it absolutely hilarious when you do look back a few years ago like you probably remember that time when a bunch of right-wing people heavily tried to use that allegory as their own thing like you you know that whole trend about being blue pilled or red pilled and stuff like that where people like 
over exaggeratingly use it like in order to uh, describe their political stance or uh, kind of like trying to say how they've opened up to which side of the political spectrum that they're on and they try to heavily use red pill but it, it, it's a hilarious nowadays considering that now now if you are going to say that you have been red pilled that means that you have opened your eyes about your true identity and now you're transitioning to a different gender so uh, I, I I like to find I, I like to think back at all those people that say that they are red pilled and they're just secretly admitting that they are are actually trans and that they are transitioning <laughs> but then again it is the right-wing people and when it comes to many of these allegories or creativity they basically have none and when they try to do something creative they mostly just steal it from others which in this case they steal it from trans people and try to claim it as their own so it's no real surprise there but anyways back to the matrix resurrection with what we got here yeah, it definitely looks like a part of this is being made for nostalgia purposes, and there is a bit of that comeback of, like, this narrative that Neo is going to be coming back, especially with, um, with uh, Keanu Reeves returning to his iconic role. Which, by the way, in terms of the narrative of what seems to be presenting us with The Matrix Resurrection, that is actually another thing that does remind me a lot of Alice in Wonderland. But not necessarily the books themselves. This actually reminds me so much more of Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland with that kind of narrative. Where, overall, it feels like the whole plot line is about bringing back Neo into the world of the Matrix so that he can go and fulfill his destiny. And it's about all these people from that Matrix world trying to wake him up and realize what he is meant to do. And like he's supposed to go and save the world, which is the Matrix world and stuff like that. So that's why uh, like I, I, I could be wrong, by the way, like this could this might not be the narrative whatsoever, but it's just from this trailer alone. That's the feeling that I'm getting of what this plot line is all about. It's trying to reignite the memory of Neo to remember that he is the one. He is the one that's supposed to save people, to save everyone, and to save the Matrix, and all that kind of stuff. Where, like, after giving him the red pill, he's supposed to be the one to wake all the others uh, to realize that they're all just in a digital world uh, that with the... I know, I know the Matrix is such a complex world and stuff like that, but the whole point is to wake Neo back up. That, that, that's basically the whole idea that I'm getting in Matrix Resurrection or what they are presenting to me, uh, in terms of that plot point. So. I understand in that regard, it doesn't seem all that interesting. Like, yeah, like it, it feels like it's one of those movies that is made for fans. Like this is especially made for those Matrix fanboys and fangirls and um, all, all different genders who love uh, the Matrix and stuff like that. That this is a movie especially for them to see the comeback of all the beloved characters and to see all the action happening. And that is the big thing about this trailer that it is trying to sell. Like, if the story isn't selling it to you, then that's perfectly fine because that's not its main goal. The main reason why you would want to watch The Matrix is for the visuals, is to see all the action going on, is to see Neo be back doing what he does best by manipulating The Matrix in order to go and, like, switch things up and defend by all the laws and physics that we all know into this entire digital realm and especially at the end uh that is what we are seeing so far with all the other characters and not to mention uh little throwbacks from before like you see uh neo back in the dojo uh trying to jog his memory and know how to do kung fu and stuff like that so you got a bit of those throwbacks and, and not to mention, like, you also got those moments, yes, the, like, the bullets are being stopped, um, yeah, like, I, I think, like, by this moment or something, or, like, yeah, you, you, you see the moments where you see Neo trying to manipulate bullets going from one side or another, like, you see a helicopter shooting, like, a bazooka, and it goes completely in a different direction, and, and, and not to mention, like, uh, plenty of other scenes that do happen, all the action, 
like logics and physics, slow motions, car chase scenes, and like running through walls and dodging bullets. You get all that. Like this trailer is pretty much selling you in the action. They know very well that's what you want to see. You want to see really cool special effects in really cool action scenes, and that is what they are delivering. So what they are promising The Matrix is, is pretty much this highly action-packed, visual effects extravaganza like yeah there will be a story and a narrative that's going on that will be more uh for the fans and for them to like reconnect with the world of the matrix but for the most part especially for casual viewers and for the general public this is the kind of movie that is made to go and watch the action you want to see some crazy action happening then the matrix resurrection will deliver that for you but one thing I will say that I find it very interesting right now, and that's going to be something that I feel like we should all be keeping an eye on, is going to be regarding the fact that it is coming out during Christmas. And since that's going to be coming out during the holidays, it does make me wonder, how is this going to go and how is this going to compare against Spider-Man No Way Home because The Matrix Resurrection so far is highly anticipated and so far there's a lot of people out there who are extremely hyped up about it especially with the uh, trailer that I have here this is from the YouTube channel of uh, Warner Brothers Pictures and it's gotten significantly popular just on this video alone already has more than 27 million views so, yeah, there is a lot of hype that's going on for it, but considering that Spider-Man is also another movie that, in a way, does deliver a lot of the same things with uh, a bit of nostalgia for the past movies and a lot of action, and not to mention manipulating a whole bunch of uh, laws and physics thanks to the involvement of Doctor Strange and the multiverse and stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of similar comparisons that you can find with no no Way Home and The Matrix Resurrection, and it does make me wonder, considering how these two movies are going to be duking it out, which one is going to remain on, which, which one is going to be on top? Who is going to really, like, um, stand as the must-watch movie of Christmas? Or you never know, maybe there's a massive, a massive plot twist and both of them could turn out to be box office flops because they're no match for Sing 2. <laughs> nah, I'm just fooling around. Honestly, if I could go and make a, an actual prediction right now, I would probably have to go with Spider-Man No Way Home and that is mainly because of the fact that with Spider-Man No Way Home, the only way you'll be able to watch it is on the big screen. Whereas The Matrix Resurrection, well, that might end up uh, screwing itself over over with the simultaneous release of both the big screen and on HBO Max. And chances are many people might consider that they'll just go and see Spider-Man on the big screen where then after they'll just go and watch The Matrix Resurrections on HBO Max where they could just go and watch it at home. I feel like that might be a pretty strong possibility. But again, considering the uh, similarities between those two films and the amount of hype that's going on each um, I feel like this is something that we will have to wait and see with how this goes at the box office. But yeah, overall, that's uh, what we got right over here with The Matrix Resurrections. It looks pretty interesting, and I'm sure it could definitely deliver on all the action and maybe some hype as well for uh, longtime fans. And if you guys are excited to go and check out Matrix Resurrection, then keep in mind that the movie is going to be coming out on December 22nd. All right, with that said and done, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about this trailer of The Matrix Resurrection? Did you guys really like this one? Are you hyped up for this trailer? Are you a little bit iffy on this? And especially, if you are a fan of The Matrix movies, how do you feel about this trailer for The Ma for, uh, Matrix Resurrections? Let me know what you think. Okay, let's see. Ah, of course, the Matrix fourth movie. Honestly, I only like the first movie, but then again, most people do. <laughs> uh, but the two following ones completely broke. In my opinion, the spirit of the first installment. Even with all the reviews and parodies done, both on TV and on YouTube, I can only appreciate the work put into the original movie. In short, I'll pass this one. Sorry, Santa. Sorry, Santa. 
<laughs> what do you mean, sorry, Santa? Why do you have to apologize to Santa? This is a Wachowski movie, not a Santa Claus movie. <laughs> yeah, like I like y y that. That would be pretty interesting. Like Santa's hot take is that he'll prefer Matrix Resurrections instead of Spider-Man No Way Home. That would that would be an interesting reaction to see on social media. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. I've never seen the Matrix movies aside from the one seen in Space Jam, A New Legacy, but damn, bro, that trailer was quite the treat. The action scenes are really creative, the storyline is pretty intriguing, and those visuals, man, mwah. If, uh, if I do decide to watch it, I'll definitely have to watch uh, the first Matrix. But then again, my plan for the film was mainly just watch for Neil Patrick Harris and Jonathan Groff, so my hands are kind of tied here. Yeah, and uh, I'll just say right now, considering the bad reputation that is currently going on with the Matrix sequels, I think it's best to just go and stick to the first one. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the case of Matrix Resurrections, the only the only thing that it will look back in terms of the previous movies is just going to be regarding the first film. And that's pretty much it. I would be shocked if they would even acknowledge the events of the second and third film. Uh, let's see what else we got here. This trailer definitely got me interested. While I'm not a big fan of the Matrix films, I definitely won't deny how it was a revolutionary franchise for its time. As for this film, I think it has potential, it absolutely looks visually impressive, and the action looks awesome. But I am worried if it could suffer it uh I'm worried if it could suffer if it tries to copy elements from the first Matrix movie. I think it might, because we did already see some elements that are trying to be copied, especially when they, some could argue that it is rehashing a little bit of that plot line of Neo denying who he truly is or that his world is not real and it's all digitized and stuff like that. So you do have those elements that are being copied, not to mention the fact that I did brought up that he, that uh, Neo is back in the dojo uh, trying to train his skills and trying to remember who he is or preparing to fight against the bad guys that are going to be uh confronting him and stuff like that so there will so yeah there might be some rehashing but it is going to be more for nostalgia purposes uh let's see what else we got here okay i'm going to be honest i think it looks pretty cool bear in mind i didn't watch the other sequels because well they sound way too complicated for what for what was rather a straightforward movie. Lord, watching the Nostalgia Critics review back in the day made me go, what? I'll see it on HBO Max. Also, I'm going to say this. Keanu Reeves looks much better with the beard than he did, uh, than he does as clean shaven Neo. Uh, the face shape, along with not being a Tim Burton pasty anymore, plus the longish hair. Yeah, I, I guess ever since uh, John Wick, he pretty much made a complete identity of himself with that long hair and the beard. Because I will admit, uh, like he, like there was that one moment where we see him clean shaven, and I think it was the last uh, Bill and uh, Bill and Ted movie. And I'll just say this right now: I think he looks way better with a goatee than just clean shaven. Because oddly enough. When he shaves his beard, he actually looks much older than he would with it. So, uh, honestly, it, it's a good look. And, and honestly, he he should, like, trademark that look. He he should keep it, honestly. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? What other comments would we have? Uh, considering I have only watched the first Matrix... Good for you. Keep it that way. Uh, well, <laughs> unless you want to see Resurrections. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't really feel that excited since I'm not that into the Matrix, but still, holy crap, that does look amazing. The action, the effects, the environments, and the acrobatics are so insane that I don't really have any words to describe. As for the story, I'm guessing that they are trying to hide it as not to spoil anything too early. And that could be true, and what I am saying about the narrative and the plot, I could totally be wrong on it. I'm just guessing based on what we are seeing with uh, this trailer right over here. So again, like I could be completely off with what I'm saying, but the guess of what I'm seeing right over here is that, yeah, this, is, this could be a case that the visuals will be much more of a stronger point than the story. So that's what I'm predicting, at least. Uh, what else we got here? I wouldn't call myself a diehard Matrix fan, but with this trailer, I am very intrigued. The visuals uh, the visuals are immersive, the Alice theming is interesting, and a lot of fun callbacks to the other movies. However, even with the positives, they still have yet to convince me to... Oops, excuse me. They still have yet to convince me to watch it. I'm not going to be in a rush to see this film, so yeah. 
All right, so I'll read uh, one more comment before we jump into the next one. I really enjoyed the Matrix movies. Even with its algorithms between this and Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass, this trailer did get me to the hype uh, due uh, to the special effects and with the song right, White Rabbit. But the only thing I do have to criticize is the fact that this does not have the tinted dark green shading like it does in the original movies. And my theory is when Neo died, the machines might have rebooted his system and somehow rebooted his memory to the way he was. That could definitely be a case, but ultimately, the best thing we can do is just wait and see when the movie is coming out on December 22nd. And it's pretty intriguing to see a lot of people uh, saying that if they are interested in seeing it, they might just see this on HBO Max. So yeah, uh, I think uh, Spider-Man doesn't have to worry with uh, No Way Home and how it might do at the box office. All right, so the next story that I have over here, this is actually a new addition, a last minute addition onto this, because this is actually a project that I find to be very interesting, to be honest. Right now, it's going around the Toronto International Film Festival trying to be sold, but what they are trying to sell is an intriguing project that actually goes into mental health. But at the same time, today, they also released a new clip for this uh, significant short to show what the, this could be all about, to give people an idea of how this is going to be. So with that said, let's go ahead and check out the first minute to the animated short called Bug Therapy. Share your deepest, darkest secrets? <laughs> nope. <laughs> oh! <laughs> okay. Hey, welcome to the group. I'm Dr. Pill. Oh, I'm not in the group. Yep, that was bug therapy. And you might have noticed that there might be some familiar people that are among the cast. And yes, actually, because uh, within the cast, there's actually not A-list celebrities per se, but a bunch of recognizable names that you might be familiar with. Uh, for example, in the cast right over here, who they got include Megan Trainer as the main character, Cintra, uh, Cin uh, Citronella? Yeah, Citronella. Uh, we also got Jay Leto, Sterling K. Brown, Tom Green, uh, Emily Goglia, and Jason Re uh, Rezig. As well, yes, people, who you have heard here is absolutely correct. That is, in fact, Dr. Phil. Yes, even Dr. Phil is among the cast, and I do find it, I do find it, honestly, is one of the weirdest additions, because when you do watch, like, a movie or an animated project... One of the last people you would expect to find in there is legitimately freaking Dr. Phil. And yes, he actually plays a character that looks like Dr. Phil, that talks exactly like Dr. Phil, and his name is in fact Dr. Pill. But then again, you might be wondering, what is this all about? So what what is this uh, short specifically? Well, uh, just to go and quickly read you here from my source here on Deadline, uh, it states here, in Bug Therapy, Citronella, played by Megan Trainer, a mosquito who faints at the, sight, uh, at the sight of blood, tries to muster the courage to attend group therapy led by Dr. Pill, which is, of course, Dr. Phil, to overcome her phobia. 
She learns that everyone faces mental health struggles. Stick Bug battles depression over never feeling seen. Fly is OCD slash germaphobe and can't stop washing his hands. Grasshopper suffers from an addiction to coffee. Praying Mantis is narcissistic and delusional and believes that she's God. Dragon, uh, dragonfly couple uh, are codependent. And a spider tries to overcome his phobia of spiders. And yes, we do have a whole bunch. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, we do have a whole bunch of different celebrities that are a part of this. Uh, and even the filmmakers uh, are actually a part of the cast as well. Jason Raising of Smallfoot is not just uh, playing as Spider, but he is also the director, as well as the writers, which is from uh, who are actually from The Tonight Show, Michael Jan and Michelle Jordan. They're actually uh, the like, not only are they the writers of this, but they are also uh, playing the role of the dragonfly couple, which is also why they also managed to get Jay Leno to go and play as the fly in this uh, movie. And um, we also got a quote here, by the way, coming from uh, Michael and Michelle saying here right now, more people than ever are struggling with mental health. We just wanted to make people laugh and say everyone's struggling with something and there's no shame in asking for help. We're blown away by the amazing stars who instantly jump on board to make this film as funny and entertaining as it is. Their hilarious performances show it's okay to not be okay. But the reason why for its existence, you might be wondering with the animation that they have presented, who made this and what's the purpose of it all? Is it go? Is it to go and present mental health? Well, N not necessarily. Well, OK, yes, but that's not the main reason. Uh, the main reason is because of the fact that this is actually made by none other than Epic Games. And this is actually part of the Epic Games mega grant. I think I've previously talked about it before in Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, or maybe not. I, I Or maybe I have just only read about it. But anyways, for those of you who don't know what the mega grant is about, uh, this is a major program. In fact, this is a hundred million dollars program in order for people to go and take the Unreal Engine technology and to really go and um, like explore what else can you do because a lot of people would think with the Unreal technology you would just go and make games. Well that's not the case. You can also do a whole bunch of other stuff with it including visual effects, special effects, and even animation which is exactly what they are trying to do here with this animated short called bug therapy. Now there is no announcement in terms of when it's going to be released or who's going to be distributing it. That's what uh, currently Epic Games are looking for right now. They're trying to go and sell it at the Toronto International Film Festival, hoping to find a buyer and they would go and uh, turn bug therapy into something that seems like they want to go and turn this into a franchise to turn it into what they're saying is called the Citronella stories. At least, um, that that seems to be the big goal of uh, what they want to do, at least with this short in particular. But yeah, the big the big thing is that they have this brand new animated short. It has an impressive list of uh, celebrities that are voicing in this. Uh, not to mention, I, I forgot to also add Tom Green is also a part of the cast as well. And right now they're looking uh, for a buyer. Now, normally I wouldn't wa I wouldn't go and talk about these things because I, I am aware that a lot of people would just be watching this and, and, and like they would be seeing this and either might not be interested or wondering like, what is this? Because they're completely unfamiliar with it. But I do have a bit of a confession to make. And one thing that immediately attracted me into seeing this is honestly because of the fact that um, I'm not going to lie. This mosquito here, this Cintronella, my God, she is so cute. Like, I just adore this design. Yeah, she's supposed to be a mosquito, but there's just something about her that I find her to be absolutely adorable. Even with the little quirks that she presented in this short, that she's a little clumsy and stuff like that. Like, honestly, I can't help but feel like, you know, I, I'm kind of attracted to that. Like, she, and, and especially with the way she she's dressed and, like, she made up her hair. She looks like she's ready to go to the dance or something like that. Or, like, re ready to go for, to, to the ball or something like that. Like, if, if she would ask me out, I would definitely say yes. Like, if we are the same size, of course, that would also be a major factor because she's literally a freaking mosquito. Uh, but, but, yeah, honestly, um, 
No, I, I just got to add, like, j just throw it out there. She's absolutely cute. Uh, really digging this uh, this concept. And, and not to mention, like, I I'm sure th uh, this is like one of those um, this is one of those things that I feel like or w one of those projects that like if this ever gets popular, if this ever gets more no no notice and like people are looking into it, I feel like this would be the kind that people would definitely be loving these characters or the kind that they would love this fan art especially like you got the praying mantis character it's like yeah you got another animated goth girl so of course like you'll get a lot of people getting attention to that or like you you, you just holler at pan pizza yo check out this uh, mantis goth chick work here is done that's how you get some popularity right there but yeah um like honestly from what i'm seeing like just just to get into the clip that like we have over here i will say the animation is absolutely impressive and i think that is another major goal with what they want to do with bug therapy considering that this is all about bugs and you got to make everything around them completely life-size it, it really shows that with this one um, they, they really want to go and show off with the kind of technology that they do present, like especially like w with this shot alone here with how they really do emphasize everything like the uh, the hair of Citronella and how detailed it is or how she is right next to this glass and like the way that 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 it heavily reflects that's like another key thing thing or even like we back it up like just this uh this camera shot of, of where we see Citronella flying around this glass. Like just this shot as the camera just goes around, goes around it like th like a part of this is really meant to show off the Unreal Engine technology to really show what it can do in terms of uh, the animation. And, and honestly, with what they are presenting here, like it really looks legit. It really looks solid with how they are executing this. It, it, it does look like a legitimate system that they could use in order to make animated projects, but like it, it but but I will add it's not just the factor of the technology that does make it look amazing but also the designs as well and I've already mentioned about the character designs a little bit like um how Citronella does look very cute and like even looking at all the other characters as well that they have their own little like cute personalities like you got the the, the fly that has complete OCD and always a, a germaphobe like you got the little you got the little couple here and yeah like even the dragonfly like the dragonfly girl here I gotta admit she's also really cute um then like you got the the hyped up crazy stick like the the grasshopper like just addicted to coffee and then of course like this girl over here which I'm sure like if you're into goth girls like she'll definitely be added on the list of like cute cartoon goth girls so like you got like you gotta get you gotta have another one so like among the cats, it has that cute round style, like kind of uh, like I would almost say re like anthropomorphic and retro in a way with the kind of bugs that you would see in these old cartoons that are mostly human, are mostly cute, that they, they are more in the direction of like Jiminy Cricket in terms of how they look as a bug instead of actually being a bug as well. Oh, yeah. And not to mention that we also do have the uh the Dr. Phil bug as well. We got freaking Dr. Phil. <laughs> you, you, you can't forget to mention about Dr. Phil also. So, so yeah, we, we do have that. But overall, I will say with this, um, with this trail, well, not necessarily a trailer, but this clip right over here with, with what we have, I will say this is honestly very impressive. And for the technology, for like, in order to go and fully present what the Unreal technology could do for animation, I think this is a pretty good start. And not just that, but I feel like this does have a bit of potential in order to present uh, the Citronella stories as a legitimate franchise. I could see, like, with the right marketing team and... Um, you know, with a, with a good studio uh, behind it that can go and really expand it, I can see the strong potential for this to become a, a solid and massive franchise. I can actually see that legitimately happen. And so far, uh, with this clip alone, they have provided a good first impression. So ultimately, I think we will have to wait and see 
with uh, how things are going to go at the uh, Toronto Film Festival and if people are going to go and legitimately buy this. I, I could see I could see this have a, a prominent future if done right. Like th that that's also a key thing. They need to have the right people because th there are some chances that maybe another prominent studio could buy it and it seems like a good idea at first but then they'll just treat it as like this throwaway franchise and it might fail altogether like the, the the big thing is just marketing is key they do have the materials but it requires a buyer for someone who knows how to take those materials and to present it to the world that's going to be a major key factor onto this but so far uh i'm impressed with what they are showing with this clip and uh let's hope for the best for the uh future of bug therapy all right, so with that said, I'd like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, uh, what do you think of that bug therapy clip, and what do you think about the whole idea in general? Are you guys into this idea? Uh, do you like what you, what you see so far with bug therapy? Are you more turned off by it? Let me know what you all think on this. All right, let's see what we got. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the animation in this looks good, despite the fact that Epic Games and Unreal Engine are doing this. Well, it's not despite. I think it's more of like a feature. I'm, I mean, that's like the whole point. I mean, it's not like a hindering thing. So I wouldn't use the word despite in this. But anyways, the animation looks smooth. And not only that Dr. Phil is in this, but the Tonight Show hosts are involved with this as well. I never really watched Dr. Phil that much, but I heard that he was the greatest. Uh, I hope this movie or short will do good. And uh, I do feel the same way that you do, Animat. The Mosquito Lady does look cute and attractive. Uh, if I was a bug, I would want to date her. Yeah, but you can't because back the hell off. <laughs> She's mine, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways, uh, let's see what we got here. It's been a long. It's been a long time since uh, I've seen a story. That made me want to say, what the frickin' rickety hickety smickety rickety frickety dickety pickety stickety hell is going on? Whew! You guys gotta give me credit to go and read all that in one shot. Anyways, um, and yet here we are, but the clip seems fine enough. The animation is pretty good, and the voice cast is really insane, so chances are I'll try and check it out. But we but we have had uh, Katie Curran, B. Larry King, and now Dr. Pill. Uh, what's next? Are the animators gonna get horny over a lobster with the likeness of Lin-Manuel Miranda? Well, and it, you know, honestly, with that comment there... I would argue technically Sony Animation already did that because they did take Lin-Manuel Miranda and turn him into a kinkajou for Vivo. So you're not entirely off with what you just said. So I'm, I'm only saying that, yeah, the Lin-Manuel Miranda aspect has already been done with the kinkajou. <laughs> All right. Anyways, um, this short sounds pretty interesting. But th uh, bug therapy has some great potential if it will get people talking. The animation looks very nice, especially with Citronella and the bugs looking very cute. And I do agree with you. Uh, it is also pretty funny that Dr. P uh, Dr. Phil was Dr. Pill. Let's see how this short goes when it comes out. I know that Megan Trainer was all about that base. Am I right? Well, yeah, of course, of course. Okay, that's where I know Megan Trainer. I, I was trying, you know, before starting this, I was trying to figure out like where do I know Megan Trainer from? Like she must have done like a really popular song that I've known, and I tried to figure out where she's from. And like, yeah, she was like in the Playmobil movie and stuff like that. But then it's like, okay, yeah, all about that bass, of course. How the fridge did I forget about that? Uh, but yeah, but you know, I just realized that it like I think the big thing that will get people talking. I think like what should get a lot of people interested, other than the cute designs would have to be the fact that this is a cartoon about mental health and honestly i think that like considering how they did mention how mental health is becoming more and more of a hot button topic and something that we should be more aware of i i, I think that should be like that should be like a key factor to really get everyone's interest and to get people talking about like hey check out this cartoon that actually discusses about mental health and considering that cartoons are now a lot more open to discuss about mental mental health including adventure time why not go and add bug therapy into this you know I, I think like in the right hands like presenting this as a cartoon that discusses about mental health like it, it should really help out uh, let's see what we got here 
Uh, this sounds interesting. It's too bad that it's only a short because I think something like this could really work well as a feature length movie. Either way, I will definitely be checking this out whenever it comes to North America. The only other thing I'll mention is that I remember when Toy Story did a short that was similar to this called Small Fry. But aside from that, uh, I would be interested in seeing this. I, you know, it's been a while since I've seen Small Fry, but I do get what you're talking about. And there might be a little bit of that familiarity because I remember there was that one scene where all the Happy Meal toys come together for like a little therapy session. So I do understand the similarities where you're going with. I would have to rewatch it again because I don't think that short is about mental health. Uh, but still, like I like I get the similarities. Uh, let's see what else do we got here? What other comments would we have? All right. A uh, very cute and deep concept indeed. Not only it will tackle behavioral issues such as those displayed and maybe autism. Well, there's no confirm for, there's no confirmation about autism, so like don't 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 hold your breath on that. Uh let's see. But uh it might also promote the role of insects in this uh biodiversity. I might be speculating on the possibilities of the scenario, uh, but at least we could try to imagine the aspects of the subjects presented here. Also, even if the mosquito looks cute, I'm more of a Rachurna Rasherna Ark. I'm screwing up this name from Monster Mu Monster Muzume. Hold on a sec. I need to look up this uh, character. <laughs> Rasherna. I'm sorry, by the way, if I'm like really messing up the uh, the name here. Uh, but let's see. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, I I, I get it. I get it. Like, yeah, well, I, I see what you mean. Well, I mean, it's literally a girl with a with a spider butt and spider legs. So, yeah, I understand the appeal of her, of course. Well, let's, I, I just hope she doesn't actually have like the personality of a black widow or like spiders where like after they make love, like they would literally eat the males, you know, like I, I, as long as she as long as like. I, if I would date her and I would get to live afterwards, then maybe it would be a good consideration. <laughs> All right, I'll read one more comment before we jump on to the uh, next uh, story here. This looks impressive overall. I like the animation, unique characters, and good voice acting, although Tom Green is someone I never thought I, uh, he would appear after seeing him appear in bad movies. Uh, I don't know which studio would likely to buy off this short, though. Uh, I could guess that maybe Netflix or Apple TV could buy it, but I hope it goes well at TIFF. Yeah, ultimately... We'll just have to wait and see. I mean, I'm just doing my part to give this more exposure to show people that we got a cartoon uh, that's all about mental health and it's got some really cute designs like with this girl here. Like, my God, I really like this girl. Uh, but we'll just wait and see with how this goes and we'll see if bug therapy even has a future in the first place. Okay, so the next story that I have over here, oh boy, are we going to get into something very interesting right over here, because we are going to be discussing about the future of Paramount Pictures. But you might be wondering, why Paramount Pictures? What's going on with them? Well, there will be a massive leadership change, and the new ruler of Paramount, well, let's just say he is actually a very, very familiar name amongst the animation community. So let's go ahead and get right into the story of Paramount Pictures. Yes, uh, after, uh, after ever since uh, 20, 20, uh, is it 2017? Yeah, I think it is ever since 2017. Yes, ever since the man was in charge in 2017, Jim Giannopoulos has announced that he is going to be leaving Paramount Pictures as chairman and CEO. Now, one thing I would like to clarify here, the good news is, is that no, Jim Giannopoulos did nothing wrong. I, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Now, I understand that when it comes to these stories, usually there would be some kind of drama that would be attached to it. Like, oh, he's leaving because of a scandal. Oh, because of some hashtag me too moment or something like that. Very, very similar to what happened to the leadership of Warner Brothers, where the head of uh, that studio had to be kicked out and be replaced by someone else. But this is not the case here. I'll be I'll, I'll go more into this a little later, but it's more the case of out with the old and in with the new, where nowadays, the kind of leadership that Jim Giannopoulos is presenting, it's not bad, but in this ever-evolving climate of entertainment, it needs a significant update, and his ways, well, they're considered old-fashioned, so they need to go and find someone else. But the big question is, who would go and replace Jim Giannopoulos? Who is going to be the next chairman and CEO of Paramount Pictures? Well, that's the part where it gets very interesting because the next person is going to be none other than Nickelodeon's very own Brian Robbins. Yes, Brian Robbins has been announced that he shall be the next chairman and CEO of Paramount Pictures. Or at least, as I'm recording this, uh, it has not officially been confirmed as of yet. They are talking about it, but it seems extremely likely that Brian Robbins is indeed going to be the next CEO and chairman of Paramount Pictures. Now, what does that mean for Nickelodeon? Does that mean they would have to go and find new leadership? Well, believe it or not, no, because uh, they stated here that apparently with Brian Robbins, he is actually going to be taking care of both, where on top of his new duties at Paramount Pictures, he is still going to be remained as the president of Nickelodeon. Now, just to go and give you a quick summary about Brian Robbins, because I'm sure some of you may not necessarily be familiar, and there are some factors that some people will be bringing up that like might seem a bit out of context, but just to give you a quick summary, all his life, Brian Robbins was into entertainment, and he was working in the entertainment business. In fact, he was actually one of the stars of uh, an old sitcom called Head of the Class back when he was a kid. And then later on, when he got older, he decided to go and become a filmmaker, to become a director. But a lot of the stuff that he was directing, however, well, they were, um, I think lackluster would be a nicer term, uh, especially when he is the director of a few Eddie Murphy flops, including Me, Dave, and of course, being the director of the infamous Norbit. So yeah, that was him. Uh, but then, after his directing duties, he decided to go more into the business of uh, entertainment. And that's when he decided to go, a few years later, to go and start his new company, which he called Awesomeness. And on social media, Awesomeness really got a lot of major uh, popularity, especially on YouTube, with Awesomeness TV. It wasn't until in 2018, when Brian Robbins ultimately decided to go and sell Aw Awesomeness TV, or I think I think it was in uh, 2012 or 2018. Hold on. Uh, I actually got my source here. And um, yes, actually, um, it was uh, or no, actually, it was in. Uh, no, OK, yeah. So in 2012, he founded Awesomeness TV. But then later on, he actually sold it to DreamWorks Animation. But then uh, later on, he actually went and it was in 2018 when Viacom actually bought off the platform from DreamWorks uh, Animation. Uh, but so, yeah, like that whole thing happened. So after uh, Awesomeness TV was sold to DreamWorks Animation uh, in 2017, that's when Brian Robbins decided to go and join Viacom so that he would go and lead the charge to Paramount Players. But then literally a year later, they decided to go and switch things up, where instead of being in charge of Paramount Players, he would go and lead the charge for Nickelodeon and be the president of that company in particular. Which leads us to today, where now Brian Robbins is going to become more and more of a powerful executive, where he shall also be in charge of Paramount Pictures. So, I'm sure with all that said, a lot of you are probably thinking right now, why Brian Robbins? Why get the guy from Nickelodeon to go and be in charge of Paramount Pictures, to also be in charge of Paramount Pictures? Well, I know I know it's a little bit of a 
confusing factor here, and a lot of people might not be on board with this, because I understand that with Brian Robbins, when it comes to his leadership at Nickelodeon, he is a bit controversial. Not everyone is necessarily a fan of Brian Robbins, and he does get some criticism here and there with how he would go and handle business with Nickelodeon, especially when it comes to spamming SpongeBob and saying that he's the one who is responsible for all the spinoffs that we're getting, inclu including uh, Camp Coral and the Patrick Star Show, on top of several other factors as as well. So why is it that Brian Robbins would get the job uh, instead of anyone else? Why would he be the one replacing Jim Giannopoulos? Okay, so let me get into the factor about the out with the old and in with the new. So with the thing with Jim Giannopoulos, yeah, when he started working as the leader of uh, Paramount Pictures after having a long, uh, you know, after taking a, a good long while working at 20th Century Fox and leading the charge for that company, like, at First, he wasn't doing so hot with Paramount, but then, uh, as the years go by, he did get better and better, especially when he was responsible for taking the charge and, and building up new franchises for Paramount Pictures, including the Quiet Place movies, and especially with the last feature film to ever be massively successful before the pandemic hit, Sonic the Hedgehog. However... Nowadays, uh, his view, like I said before, the way that he's been running Paramount Pictures has been considered a bit old fashioned. And considering that things have been massively evolved with the way that people have been consuming their entertainment, especially through streaming and because of the pandemic, they want to have a new leader that has more of a modern understanding of how things work right now when it comes to people consuming entertainment and where to go and distribute movies and stuff like that. So that's why Jim Giannopoulos had to go and why he decided that now's the best time for him to leave. So enter Brian Robbins, and with his experience that he has, not just with Nickelodeon, but also with Awesomeness TV, Brian Robbins does legitimately have that modern, uh, he does have that modern mentality and does have a lot more of an understanding about how streaming works and especially with how social media works. Uh, in the streaming factor, especially with what he does with Nickelodeon, you got to keep in mind, with Brian Robbins leading Nickelodeon, or what is a essentially Viacom CBS's family and animation division, he is pretty much the one who is in charge of like going through a whole bunch of different aspects. Like he has touched upon many different mediums and many different fields to make sure that the Nickelodeon brand and the family friendly brand of Viacom CBS can be prominent. Uh, rather it be on television with the Nickelodeon channel or maybe through movies with the Nickelodeon movies brand by recently releasing stuff like uh, Sponge on the Run and Paw Patrol the movie. Uh, even the pre, speaking of which, the preschool program uh, with shows such as uh, Paw Patrol and uh, many, many others. And then on top of that, you also got streaming as well. And that is also a major significant factor, like with by by bringing up Paramount Plus, that you got to know how to go and implement all the family friendly content that you would that that would go in there. On top of finding a good blend of distributing things in the traditional factor to put it up on the Nickelodeon channel and to go and put it up on the new mediums as well for streaming services. And Brian, and we know that Brian Robbins is a major factor when it comes to shaping the family-friendly aspect of Paramount+. Plus, So that is exactly why he got that position, is the fact that he has that knowledge of the new medium, of the new distribution platform of streaming, how it can work out on Paramount+, Plus, and not to mention with uh, his relationship that he already has with other streamers as well. We already know about Nickelodeon's relationship with uh, Netflix, and how they have been distributing some movies onto that platform, rather it be stuff like The 
Hey Arnold Jungle movie or uh, the Invader Zim movie or just recently with the Loud House movie as well and coming soon with the Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Like you got all those features that are already set up despite the fact and, and also not to mention as well almost forgot but also the collaboration between Nickelodeon and Netflix with Glitch Tech. So Brian Robbins does have a pretty clear idea of how streaming works and how to find that good blend of the traditional and the modern digital as well. So that's the mentality that you kind of need nowadays in order to go and run a major studio, to have that clear understanding and find that good blend in order to maximize both the profitability and the engagement from audiences in both different platforms. But it's not just that as well, but it, there is also the aspect of social media. And that is one thing that many executives are pretty much out of touch because we all know we have that image of executives being a bit old fashioned and not having much of an understanding of how things work nowadays. It's mostly through their kids or through their families that they would kind of have an understanding of stuff like social media or how modern things work out. But it's kind of imperative right now that you do know how social Social media works, how you can use it to its maximum capabilities in order to go and market your programming. And that is what Brian Robbins have, uh, uh, that, that Brian Robin has, uh, especially with his experience through Awesomeness TV. So from there, Brian Robbins would have more than enough capabilities to know how social media can work and how they can go and uh, use uh, publicity, use marketing and use advertisings in order to go and present those Paramount movies onto uh, that uh, onto social media platforms like uh, like and, and know the different ways of how these different platforms work. Like he knows very well the significant difference between something like YouTube uh, and Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, Reddit and all these others. He knows how the mo you know, he knows how people consume their entertainment nowadays. He knows how that works. And that is exactly how he has that job. And honestly, that is that is actually going to be something that we will see more and more often. Like we're not just seeing this with uh, Paramount Pictures right now by getting someone like Brian Robbins, but I think in the future we are going to see a lot more of these changes and a, a lot more switches when it comes to leadership amongst the major studio. And one that I can guarantee you that you got to anticipate that will happen is going to be regarding Walt Disney Pictures. Uh, I I actually have uh, heard somewhere that apparently Alan Horn, the uh, the head of Walt Disney Pictures, he's going to be retiring soon. He is actually seriously considering retirement, and we're going to soon see a new leadership that's going to be taking charge. And that new person who will be in charge will actually be someone who will have a clear understanding of not just how the business works with movie theaters and stuff like that, but also with Disney Plus and how to find that right middle to know how are people going to go and distribute things on both movie theaters and on Disney Plus. And I know that this is a major thing that Disney is taking massive importance right now, uh, considering that they have tried really hard to go and adapt uh, during the pandemic to make Disney Plus more and more an, a, of an important asset and to really find a lot of profitabilities, deb uh, like debatably even more so than their theme park division. So they're, they're trying to do all they can to use Disney Disney Plus as a way to regain a lot of what they have lost from many of their other divisions. So that so again, that's going to be something that we will see more and more often of these new executives who have a modern understanding of how social media works and how streaming works. And considering how Brian Robbins does have both of that knowledge, that is how he ended that's how he ended up getting that position at Paramount Pictures. Now, say what you will of him as a leader of Nickelodeon. Yeah, he has done a lot of controversial decisions, but the fact that he does have that knowledge, it's very much precious and it's something that studios like Paramount needs in order to go and survive and thrive in this modern industry in this ever changing industry right now you need to have someone who has the modern mentality of how things work right now and how people are consuming their entertainment right now and nowadays even though theaters and televisions are still a valid option it really is all about movies 
it well it's really all about streaming it really is all about social media and how you can use those in order to really maximize profitability in order to maximize engagement from audiences in order for them to go and consume even more that's going to be you know you need someone who has more of an understanding on that and that's what brian robbins has all right so with that said now uh, now that I have uh, officially put in my piece on this, I would like to know your thoughts on this because I, I really want to know, like, especially if you have any certain opinions regarding Brian Robbins or if you have heard of some of the things that he has done before. How do you feel about Brian Robbins now leading Paramount Pictures on top of Nickelodeon? Do you think he's going to do a good job? Do you think he's going to be ruining the company? Let me know what you think on this. Okay, let's see what we got here. If Brian Robbins is the new CEO, I'm really not looking forward to this. With the way Robbins has been handling Nickelodeon over the years, uh, where the network has now become a shell of its former self, and now is just focused on oversaturation of SpongeBob and treating other Nicktoons like utter crap, which has also ruined my taste for SpongeBob and Nickelodeon in general, so really, it's making me concerned about the future of Paramount. And that is exactly what I mean by the fact that it's a pretty controversial decision. That's why I want to talk about it amongst animation fans, because I know that some people have certain feelings regarding Brian Robbins, so that's what I'm curious about. Uh, let's see now. Even though Brian Robbins did some missteps throughout his career, I can see how he has an understanding about social media and streaming. I could just hope that he'll bring both Paramount and Nickelodeon into the right direction. Uh, I can wish him good luck with, with all that. Yeah, and I, I will say that even though they they didn't announce that there's going to be a new leadership change or that something is going to happen on Nickelodeon now with uh, Brian Robbins' new position, I can imagine that he's going to be a lot more busy. And while he's not going to while he's not going to leave as president, I'm sure there are going to be some other people that will come in and they will also take charge in order to fill the gap that Brian is kind of leaving out. So that's one thing I can see is that even though he'll stay as president, there will be more leadership that will be on board and do something about Nickelodeon because uh, Brian can no longer be there all the time. All right, let's see what we got here. Despite his flaws in directing, I do trust Brian Robbins that he will run Paramount very well. Hopefully, this should be able to help out with what's going on on this planet. And he does work pretty well with uh, Nickelodeon, Awesomeness TV, and Netflix, as you have stated. This guy knows uh, his CEO roots, and he could be useful in marketing the, uh, uh, the anticipated Sonic the Hedgehog 2, uh, what's next though? Are we going to have a freaking peacemaker himself, John Cena run universal pictures and Peacock? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that's going to happen, man. I mean, with John Cena, I like, I, I'm not saying he's not a businessman, but it's hard to imagine him running like a billion dollar empire. I don't know. <laughs> like the dude is very talented, but business wise, I think he has other people doing that for him. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Brian Robbins' story really fascinates me. Going from directing a, a crappy Eddie Murphy movie to becoming the head of Paramount is an insanely impressive feat. Sure, his decisions over Nickelodeon has times been, uh, uh <laughs> but here's hoping he can run Paramount well. Uh, here's also hoping he doesn't randomly burn people during the transition like the awesomeness TV show, which reminds me, I just got that joke from Phantom Strider. You ever consider getting him on the show? I mean, honestly... Yes, I would. I mean, it would, you know, I would really like, you know, I wouldn't mind at all to have Phantom Strider uh, be on the podcast. It's, it, you know, I heard he's definitely a really nice and cool guy. I would be down for it. But the only catch is, though, is that he's from Australia and we have a massively different time zone here. So uh, I don't know if it can work out in terms of timing if um, he can actually appear in the show. If he can, that would actually be really awesome. But it, it's honestly up to him. So so that's just one thing I, I would like to go and, and highlight. It's like as much as I can, I don't know if it would be possible because, well, he, like Strider would have to ultimately sacrifice sleep in order to be on board with this. So just a little warning. Okay. 
Uh, let's see. I'm extremely conflicted by this news. His past works on movies were questionable. His run during Awesomeness TV and Paramount Players was sometimes lackluster. And as for Nickelodeon, well, let's just say it was really rocky for the past few years. So having him running Paramount as a whole, well, yes, I could see it working and beneficial from an executive point of view. But from an outsider's perspective, it's a bad idea in my opinion. But then again, I don't think uh, uh, I'll matter because of capitalism sadly. Yeah, I mean, like, there is a major difference between, like, the creative aspect and, of course, the uh, the business aspect. And with Brian Robbins, yeah, like, he has made bad decisions for Nickelodeon, but recently there have also been some good marks that actually was a major win for Brian Robbins. Like, uh, you might remember earlier this year when uh, he tried to integrate Nickelodeon with the NFL to go and encourage kids to go and watch some football. And apparently that actually worked out extremely well in terms of the ratings it was the most watched program on nickelodeon for years and right now uh they're currently discussing a deal for more special programming of uh these crossovers of nickelodeon and the nfl so there have also been some good things that brian robbins has done for nickelodeon so i i'm sure with those positive marks they might have been some extra reasonings to why he would also be in charge of paramount pictures uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, do we have any other comments? Ah, there we go. Um, in my opinion, I think Brian Robbins might tank Paramount even lower. Paramount, who I consider the studio, has been struggling for years more so than Sony. I mean, I appreciate what Giannopoulos uh, was trying to pick up uh, and appreciate what he did with new franchises like A Quiet Place and Sonic the Hedgehog. With Robbins as the new leader at Paramount makes me worry a bit I feel like he might bring the company down. What's next? Is Sony going to replace Tom Rothman as president of Sony Pictures because he is old fashioned? Uh, well, Sony, I mean, let's be honest. Sony Pictures is a completely different story. I, I mean, we are pretty much at the point where we could say that Sony Pictures is a studio like none other, mainly because of the fact that, well, Sony isn't really, um, S Sony isn't really modern with the times with the way that they have been running things uh especially with the fact that they don't have their own streaming service and they're dependent on others uh to go and stream their movies like uh starting next year they're gonna have their films on netflix and then later on they're gonna have it on disney plus and i did hear that when it comes to tom rothman even though yeah that's an executive that's also extremely questionable with some of the crap that he has done uh i did hear that they did sign him on board and he is staying at sony for a few more years so when it comes to sony like they already have their plan going even if that that plan itself might be very questionable it is still a plan nonetheless uh, so we'll, we'll wait and see on that all right i think i'll go and read uh one more uh one more comment before we jump into the uh next story so um let's see I feel no matter what, people will complain about new leadership. Uh, I honestly don't know either about Brian Robbins, but I can understand choosing someone who is with the times. People like to complain about modern things like social media and movies and TV shows, but it's kind of what people want. People want to have younger people in charge of more in the sense of creativity rather than having a business degree. And you know what? Let's be honest, folks. Um, Pixar Girl here actually does have a pretty solid point. No matter what happens, no matter who would be the new person, there is going to be a handful of people that will go and they will find something to go and complain about. And especially in the case of Brian Robbins, that already uh, some people don't look fondly at the guy. There are going to be some people that are, that are ready to go and throw a hate bomb at, at him and say that, pi that Paramount Pictures is in peril right now because of... Uh, of like bad re of bad leadership with Brian Robbins and they're going to treat treat all the movies like he did with like SpongeBob and the Nicktoons and stuff like that you know that like there are going to be those people that will complain and regardless if it's Brian Robbins or if it's someone else people will go and find something to go and heavily criticize but in the case over here considering that like other than the way that he runs his business he doesn't like Brian Robbins doesn't have any other like serious controversies behind him he doesn't have any like scandals or anything like offensive that he has done over the years so ultimately i feel like it's more of a wait and see kind of deal with what's going to happen with brian robbins and the best we can do though is just 
wish him the best of luck with how he's going to run Paramount Pictures. All right, folks, moving on to the next story. Even though that I talked about the modern ways that we consume our entertainment, like uh, social media, and of course with streaming as well, that doesn't mean that the other forms are obsolete. People are still watching television to watch their shows, and people are still going to movie theaters to watch their movies. And the, the perfect example of that is, of course, with Shang-Chi, which turned out to be a massive hit at the box office and not to mention getting so many raving reviews from people i mean let's be honest the only people who would hate shang chi are the anti-woke people you know uh the the anti-woke incel channels like geeks plus gamers and the quartering and we all know that the anti-woke people just hate shang chi mainly because they're just racist <laughs> all right but anyways uh, going back to what i was talking about yes move watching movies on the big screen is still a viable option with the thanks of uh shang chi proving to be a really good example of that but because of the of the success of shang chi something else also happened something that for movie theaters and for movie theater fans this is the moment that they have been waiting for they have been waiting for months more than a almost two years even for for this certain company to gain their trust that they, you know, they've been trying to do like the simultaneous release and it's been controversial before, but now they have solidified their decision. And because of what happened with Shang-Chi, they have now decided, okay, they trust movie theaters right now. And who I am talking, of course, is regarding Disney. Yes, Disney has officially announced that the moment of simultaneous release is over. They are no longer going to go and release movies on the big screen and on Disney Plus with Premier Access at the same time. What they are going to do, it's a little bit different than the usual from before, but they have a lot more faith in movie theaters. So what they are going to do, for the remainder of the 2021 movies that they have, and for beyond onward from 2022, 2023, and beyond, uh, so movies such as Marvel's Eternals, The Last Duel, West Side Story, Ron's Gone Wrong, and The King's Man... What's going to happen is that those movies will be released in theaters and only in theaters for the first 45 days. So for those 45 days, you will only find them on the big screen. But then after those 45 days, they'll still be on the big screen. But that's when Disney will have the permission and they will go and actually put them out on digital. Rather it be like maybe on Disney Plus or they'll go and distribute it on like iTunes and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's pretty much the big thing is that after the 45 days, the exclusivity on the big screen will be gone. And then you'll also have the option of watching it at home through digital. Now, the one exception, however, and this is going to be something I will really get into later, is actually regarding Disney Animation's next feature film, Encanto, which what they are going to do with that is that, yes, that will still have the exclusivity on the big screen, but instead of uh, 45 days, it will only be on the big screen for 30 days exclusively, and then afterwards... Disney will go and release it on Disney Plus. And no, no premiere access when it does get to that platform. So on November 23rd, uh, November, no, November 23rd, on November 24th, uh, that's when Disney will go and release a Kanto on the big screen for 30 days exclusively. And then on, on Christmas Eve, Disney will go and put in Kanto on Disney Plus. Uh, but that's not all, though. At the same time, with this announcement, they have also revealed several new release dates for some highly anticipated movies. Uh, the first of which uh, was something that has been delayed again and again and again, but now it seems like we might have more of an official release date, and that is actually with, um, where was it again? Just need to remind myself. Ah, yes, of course. Bob's Burgers. Yes, the long-awaited Bob's Burgers movie finally has a brand new release date, which is going to be coming out for now on May 27th, 2022. 
But at the same time, they have also confirmed the release date for the highly anticipated live action remake of The Little Mermaid starring Holly Bailey and Melissa McCarthy, to which that one is actually going to be released an entire year later on May 26, 2023. And as for the upcoming Marvel movies, they have revealed the lineup for 2024. Now, we don't know what movies are going to be specifically, but we do know that in the year 2024, on February 16th, May 3rd, July 26th, and November 8th, that's when you're going to have a Marvel movie. But even though we do have those little announcements, the big thing that they did reveal is regarding the fact that now Disney trusts movie theaters even more. And that was one major thing that movie theaters have been struggling. And we all know that in recent years, especially during the pandemic, movie theaters had some very, very strong feelings when it comes to Disney, especially with some of their strategies with what they have done uh, when it comes to releasing their movies, either by delaying them indefinitely or, well, not indefinitely, but just keep on delaying and delaying and delaying or by releasing them on Disney+. Plus. We saw how pissed off many movie theaters were when they would take movies such as the Mulan remake, Soul, or Luca and just put them exclusively exclusively on Disney Plus or even that additional anger that they have where the the movies would be released in theaters but also on Disney Plus and we saw that frustration that they had uh with movies such as Ryan the Last Dragon and uh Black Widow, Cruella, The Jungle Cruise and several others that they were definitely not happy with that. And the reason is because movie theaters have been seriously struggling throughout this pandemic and they know for a fact that Disney Disney is the major company that could go and actually save them, that they are the ones with the major feature films that people have been highly anticipating for that could actually go and save movie theaters to encourage people to go back to the big screen to watch those movies again. But Disney doesn't want to. They don't want to have that responsibility of causing an outbreak because they were showing their movies in theaters. So that's why Disney had to go and back out. And that's why we have constantly been seeing this massive feud going on uh, against Disney and with movie theaters, especially when you do think back where before the pandemic happened, most of the biggest hits that we've had, they come from Disney. You might remember like back in 2019, the grand majority of movies that was released like with the exception of joker and maybe spider-man far from home technically with the exception of those two every single movie that made over a billion dollars they all come from Disney. Rather it be the Lion King remake, the Aladdin remake, Frozen 2, uh, Toy Story 4, Avengers Endgame, Captain Marvel, and several others. Well, okay, well, maybe it's just those, but like you you get what I mean. Those movies are oh, oh yeah, and I almost forgot uh Star Wars uh, Rise of Skywalker, but then again, that that's a movie that I want to forget. Um, but yeah, overall though, with these movies. They're, like Those are massive money makers. Those are billion dollar hits. If there is a company that knows how to help the movie business and how to help the movie theater business, it would definitely be Disney. So for a good while, the one thing that movie theaters wish they could have is Disney's trust. Once they have their trust, they actually do have the promise that things can get better for movie theaters during the pandemic. And luckily, they finally do have that thanks to Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ch of the Ten Rings. Well, technically, it's not just that, to be fair, because there is also Free Guy with Ryan Reynolds. That's technically another movie uh, that did actually have that, 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 that did actually turn out to be a major hit, and that was technically a Disney movie. Well, I mean, technically a 20th century movie, but still technically a Disney movie that was released exclusively in theaters and actually did very well at the box office that people really wanted to go and see this surprisingly well-made Ryan Reynolds movie. People were having a lot of fun with that film. So it, it, as it turns out, that movie turned out to be a hit. 
And of course, so did Shang-Chi, starting out with $90 million on its opening weekend, or technically opening Labor Day weekend, because I think, um, like, if we do count the traditional uh, three-day weekend, I think the total of that would be around, like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, around $75 million, give or take, something like that. But uh, then again, uh, like even right now, it has like I know a lot of people have been saying, well, technically, that's just the opening weekend. Let's just see how things go afterwards. But uh, I will say, like, as I'm recording this, the traction for Shang-Chi, it's going steadily well because as i'm recording as i'm recording this we just went through the second weekend of shang chi and it's actually going solidly well it is still in first place at the box office and um it, it only had a bit of a drop like a little over 50 percent which uh, i think it only made around 35 million dollars on the second weekend but it's actually pretty good it's not like a significant tower of terror style massive drop like what Black Widow went through, but still, it actually, but, like, it, it still did decently well, so, in the long run, it looks like Shang-Chi could actually do pretty decently, and that pretty much solidifies that it is a solid hit for Disney, which is why, right now, Disney does have the motivation, now they have the confidence that movie theaters are definitely commercially viable, so now that's why we are seeing for the rest of their big movies, they're going to go and release them for for the big screen only for those 45 days. And you got to keep in mind, a lot of what they have coming soon, like they're not just like small throwaway movies. I mean, yeah, there are some smaller films that Disney like is willing to take the risk on stuff like The Last Duel or Ron's Gone Wrong or The King's Man or well, not not really The King's Man. Uh, that That's still a pretty popular movie. I mean, The King, uh, the King's Men uh, franchise is still pretty big and popular, but especially with stuff like Eternals and West Side Story, those are like major motion picture events that Disney has in store, like highly anticipated for people to go and check out. And the fact that they're willing to do that as well for their movies, like to release them exclusively on the big screen, that is a major win for movie theaters. That is going to be something that could tremendously go and help out their business. But then you have Moana. And that I feel like is going to be another big test for Disney, but not just for Disney, actually, but for family films and for animated films as well. That is going to be another major test because Encanto is going to be the one to truly determine that it's going to be the big thing to see if animated features and if family films are still commercially viable if they're released exclusively on the big screen. Like that's going to be the net, like the cartoon version of Shang-Chi. And I know that technically some people could argue that yes, there are going to be some animated films that will be released on the big screen beforehand, including Ron's Gone Wrong and The Addams Family 2. But then again, I'll just say now that with um, with The Addams Family 2, they are doing that simultaneous release where they're going to put it out on the big screen and on digital as well. So that doesn't necessarily count. But the big thing with uh, with Encanto is that this isn't just an animated film. It, or did I say Moana? <laughs> sorry, folks. Okay, yeah. I, I meant to say uh, Encanto. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know why I got Moana in my, in my head. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I, I meant uh, Encanto. But, yeah, I, as I was saying, the big thing with Encanto is that um, the, the, the thing with that one, it, it, it's not just an animated feature. It's a Disney animated feature. And that's the big key element that will drive people that that will drive people on the big screen to make them want to go and see this animated film. Not to mention the fact that this is another Disney animated musical. So even more of a sedative for people to go and check it out, especially when it actually has Lin Manuel Miranda, who has been highly prominent this year in terms of the projects that he had coming out, especially with stuff like um, with Vivo on Netflix and uh, just uh, like earlier in the summer, like we. Got Got in the Heights, the movie adaptation that came out. So yeah, like he really has been on a roll and now like adding Encanto to the list. So 
And that's going to be something that people are going to see, that people are going to be very much hyped up because they trust the Disney animation brand. They trust the studio behind it to create something that would be worth watching, to be worth to go on the big screen to actually see it. And that and that is honestly something that, yeah, it might sound harsh of me to say, but almost no other animation studio honestly has right now and we have actually seen that as proof uh throughout this entire pandemic that there are only very few animation studios that people can truly trust to go and uh, check their movies out on the big screen even if this could be a pandemic like technically pixar could be another one as well but then again uh disney didn't trust putting their movies on the big screen so that's why they're just disney plus exclusives like with soul and with um with Soul and Luca, uh, and maybe some people could argue like Illumination could be another one as well. I mean, say what you will about the movies, but um, the the like the numbers don't lie. And I mean, they they're the only animation studio so far that has been making tremendous, nearly or even full on billion dollar hits with their movies. Uh, but when it comes to the rest, like those are not like the rest don't have a strong enough name to give people confidence to see their movies on the big screen. Not Warner Animation Group, because we just saw proof of that with uh, Space Jam A New Legacy. Not DreamWorks Animation, not Sony Animation, not Paramount Animation, but Disney Animation. That is a completely different story. And especially with what they have in store with Encanto, yes, that's going to be a movie that people will absolutely trust to see on the big screen. And that's why it's going to be a massive test. Now, I'm not expecting this to make the same numbers as Moana, uh, not, not as Moana, but I'm not expecting Encanto to make the same numbers as, um, as like Frozen 2, for example. In fact, I'm just going to say it right now. I don't think we will ever see a billion dollar hit in years. Uh, but in the case of uh, Encanto, I feel like if it is successful, it, it will do decently well. But don't expect it to do like any major serious numbers at the box office, uh, especially when the pandemic is absolutely unpredictable. So ultimately, it is a thing that we will have to wait and see. Not to mention the fact that it only has 30 days of exclusivity on the big screen. So like it only has 30 days to really rack up the numbers at the box office before it ends up being free on Disney Plus during the holiday season. So that is something that we we will have to see how things may go with it, not to mention how uh, the end of the year is going to be a very busy schedule for movies, especially with all the different films that are going to be massively hyped up i mean we know that in november on top of encanto we also got other major movies like uh eternals and uh the the ghostbusters afterlife movie that's going to be coming out so ultimately it is something that we will have to wait and see with how encanto can go i think that's that that is going to be disney's other big test but Overall, though, uh, the big thing with this to really highlight is that, yes, again, this is the big moment that movie theater fans and for movie theaters, they have been waiting for. Disney finally trusts movie theaters as a commercially viable source to distribute their movies, that they could trust movie theaters again to put them out on to put their movies out on the big screen and only on the big screen to go and help out their business and to get people hyped up to go and see their movies and the big proof of that is what we have seen with shang chi and if it works out with shang chi then we can imagine that it could also work things out as well with movies like west side story eternals the king's man Encanto, and many many more so that's why it looks like at least with movie theaters and with disney it might be a brighter future after all all right with that said i would like to go into the chat wall and i would like to uh, i would like to go and ask how do you guys feel about Disney's new plan with releasing their movies exclusively in theaters with a 45 day window? Are you guys excited for this announcement? Um, are there any changes that you would like to make if you were the head of Disney? Let me know what you all think about this. All right, let's see what we got here. 
Uh, it was awesome and nice that Disney finally gives respect and trust for movie theaters. Shang-Chi and Free Guy did prove that theaters were still viable through the pandemic. I can wait. Uh, I can't wait to see both Encanto and Turning Red when they both come out on the big screen. Let's cross our fingers, hoping that Disney keeps their promise and that the box office numbers would slowly but surely be stronger when Disney movies came out exclusively in theaters. I mean, yeah, we, we should definitely hope for that. Uh, but at the same time, we need to also hope that the pandemic is better because that is the key factor to Disney's decisions here. We need to hope and like we really need to do our efforts to make sure that more people get vaccinated, that more people wear masks. And yes, as controversial as it may seem, that we need more vaccine mandates and mask mandates to be implemented so that things do get better with the pandemic and that things can be better for businesses like movie theaters and for Disney in order to gain their trust to release their uh, movies right there. So that's the thing. We also like if we want the, if we want Disney to keep their promise, we need to make sure that things get better with the pandemic and that we do have more vaccine mandates and that we do have uh, mask mandates as well in order to like reduce to minimize the damage of the pandemic and hopefully that we won't have another wave coming up. Uh, let's, uh, let's see here. This actually really got me excited. After Shang-Chi became a massive success at the box office, uh, I knew as a fact Disney would find a strategy to release their movies in theaters uh, and could help revive movie theaters. However, I am wondering how movie theaters will react uh, to other major studios considering Universal did announce that Halloween Kills will be released both in theaters and in Peacock at the same time. I mean, it will be a slow process. I mean, it's more of a wing C kind of situation. But I know for a fact that with what happened with Shang-Chi, it's not just Disney that's reacting, but also plenty of other movie studios that are reacting as well. It is a sign that things are getting better with movie theaters. And I think slowly but surely we will see uh, a bit of a change. Like, if not, then starting in 2022, that's when we are going to see a lot more exclusivity for movie theaters that, like, even... Even with Warner Brothers and with Universal, they'll drop their plans of also releasing their movies digitally or through streaming and stuff like that. And even Sony, uh, after the, the big success of the first weekend of Shang-Chi, they decided to move up the release of uh, Venom Let There Be Carnage from October 15th to October 1st. So that is also another uh, significant thing that did happen because of Shang-Chi's success. So really, like, Shang-Chi has been major news that, that that shows how things are looking a lot more positive uh, with that one, <laughs> with, with movie theaters. All right, um, uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Finally! Pardon my reference uh, from that Gumball episode, but I'm very anticipated and glad to see that Eternals and Encanto are finally going to be released on the big screen. I haven't seen Shang-Chi yet, but I've heard a lot of hype that the movie has had so maybe i would go and see this not today but maybe sometime later uh that's if uh, it's still gonna be in theaters i'm pretty excited to see the two upcoming movies and i'm glad that movie theaters are getting trust uh to disney and marvel yeah it is nice uh let's see what else we have here 2021 may not be the year of normalty, but movies are returning to where they were. 2022 might be a better year with bigger success with the Marvel movies uh, that year. Also, I think people will watch Spider-Verse 2 and Minions Rise of Gru next year. Both will make money due to how huge their names unless COVID becomes stronger. Yeah, again, like you, you can't make your predictions just yet about how things will go in 2022 because... COVID is still unpredictable, and you you never know if we're going to be entering another wave after the one that we have right now. I mean, like we like we never thought this wave would exist after that. Like most people would get their vaccines, and yet here we are right now. But I'm just going to say right now that if another wave does happen after this one, then we know for a fact drastic measures are going to be taken. Uh, let's see. While I do enjoy uh, streaming. I, uh, while I do enjoy streaming, I still love theaters, and I, for one, am psyched that Disney is sticking to it. I'm probably, I'll am probably i probably be seeing these movies once they hit, except West Side Story, because screw Ansel Elgort. Uh, if you're confused, look up what he did. 
Uh, no, no, thanks. I, I think I, I think I'm good. I think I am aware. Uh, <laughs> as for the Bob's Burgers movie, I might see it if I wind up getting uh, into the show. If not, I'll just wait for a Family Guy movie. It's actually kind of weird. We don't have one yet. Yeah, it is true. But then again, you got to consider how long it took the Simpsons to go and get their movie. So maybe they might have plans for a Family Guy movie. Maybe not. But eh, who knows? Uh, let's see. I'll read two more before we jump into the final story. Um, to quote Todd from Bojack Horseman, hooray, question mark. <laughs> hooray, question mark. Uh, finally, the conflict between Disney and the cinema industry is finally over. However, uh, we have to wait and see with how the movies will perform. If the future, considering that we still, uh, we are still in the, you know what, I will definitely be celebrating if, uh, these go well at, for Disney and the box office. Yeah, I'm not expecting all of them to go well, but at least keep an eye on the big ones like Eternals, West Side Story, and Encanto. Because if those are major successes, then it'll be a bright future for movie theaters uh, going 2022 and beyond. All right, so one more comment before we uh, we do the last story. Or no, do we not have one? Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, let's see. This is good news for Disney Studios, the directors, and their teams. This will give a chance for their films to get success at the box office. Uh, Warner Brothers should do the same thing with their upcoming films by uh, ending same-day day premises on HBO Max as soon as early October so that Dune could be a big hit at theaters and avoid mistakes with The Suicide Squad. Just my opinion. Well, I think, honestly, it's a little too late with the aspect of uh, Warner Brothers and HBO Max. I think they're still sticking to their deal with, um, with uh, do, you know, doing that simultaneous release until the end of the year. It's not like they'll suddenly change their mind and stuff like that. I think they're just going to stick to it right until 2022, and then they'll go back to exclusivity. Because uh, just like what we saw with uh, the, the Matrix trailer at the beginning... They even advertise that it is going to be released both in theaters and on HBO Max. So I don't think they're going to do so with uh, with Warner Brothers. But at least with Disney, we do have the confidence their movies will be in theaters. And one thing I will add, by the way, uh, like with the aspect of Encanto, like I'm honestly surprised that they did that, actually, because turns out like I was wrong with my prediction. I honestly thought beforehand and I might have mentioned this before that I was expecting Encanto would ju would actually do the simultaneous release, you know, back when, um, you know, back when Sony had to sell away Hotel Transylvania 4 to uh, to Amazon and when uh, when the Adams Family 2 had to do that simultaneous release. I thought Disney was going to do the same thing with Encanto to release it in theaters and on Disney Plus with Premier Access. But hey, good news is that I'm wrong and I'm happy about it, actually. All right, folks, it is now time that we shall do the grand finale. And with this grand finale, may I say that Halloween season has officially begun, or at least in theme parks in places like Disney and Universal, where they are beginning their Halloween festivities, like or rather it be the Oogie Boogie Bash or Halloween Horror Nights. But there is one attraction in particular, my god, man, it is time to go and unleash everything they have in store and release some new information with what's going to be coming up. And you know what I'm talking about. Well, some do, actually. It's regarding the Haunted Mansion. And uh, one of the things that they did reveal regarding the mansion is regarding uh, the upcoming special Muppets Haunted Mansion where not only did they reveal a new release date, which is actually going to be coming soon on October 8th, but they re but they also presented some new information and some, uh, spe uh, some special appearances as well, where not only, well, surprisingly, but shouldn't be surprisingly, that Kermit the Frog is going to be cast as the ghost host, but also we got some celebrity cameos that will be involved in the form of the singing head busts, where along with uh, Geoff King, that was previously announced they also mentioned that two people that i do rem remember and recognize is craig robinson and pat sajak from wheel of fortune i know like honestly i never thought that they would top someone uh like geoff kingley to be appearing uh in the special but i will say that pat sajak 
is on that same level. I was not expecting that name to be in there. Uh, but at the same time, along with those uh, celebrity appearances, they have also revealed three original songs that are going to be a part of the special, which include Rest in Peace, Life Hereafter, and Tie the Knot Tango. Which, honestly, considering the latter, it does make me a little bit concerned. It's like, oh, crap. There, there's going to be a musical number, and it's going to involve... Yeah, okay. <laughs> but anyways, I'm not here to go and talk about uh, Muppets Haunted Mansion. I'm actually talking about a much bigger project that's actually going to be coming soon, which is the Haunted Mansion reboot. And it looks like things are a lot more official, considering that they have revealed that filming for the project is going to be starting in Atlanta sometime in, uh, well, actually next month. Next month, they will start filming the uh, production of the movie. But in order to start filming it, they're going to need some actors as well. And uh, last week, they did reveal a couple of new actors that are going to be joining the cast. And it's going to be none other than Owen Wilson and Rosario Dawson. Yes, both these actors have officially, have officially been confirmed to be a part of the cast of the Haunted Mansion reboot. And uh, keep in mind that they are not the first people who are a part of the cast here. Because uh, the first people that were announced to go and star in the movie include Lakeith Stanfield and Tiffany Haddish. And uh, if you guys want a little bit more info uh, in terms of the behind the scenes factors, uh, they already have uh, a bit of a crew that's already working on this or already worked on this where they got uh, Kate, uh, Katie Dippold uh, writing the script on this, and they got Justin Simeon directing the movie. And uh, when it comes to this project, however, we don't really have any much information outside of that. We don't know who these actors are going to play. We don't know if either Owen Wilson or Rosario Dawson, if they're going to be playing as uh, new actor, uh, new characters, or if they're going to play recognizable characters from the attraction. But uh, reading from my source here on The Hollywood Reporter, we do have a little bit of extra information where they stay here. Story details are being kept in the dark, but it is known that... Uh, ostensibly, the film will follow a family that moves into the titular mansion. However, it is the characters around that nucleus that will have a big portion of the moonlight shining on them. And that's so far all that we know, uh, is that Owen Wilson and Rosario Dawson are added to the cast of the mansion. And one thing I will say, like, I, I just want to start things off uh, to go and make something clear that when, like the addition of having people like Owen Wilson and Ro Rosario Dawson, that does seem a pretty uh, promising look. You know, it does sound pretty, you know, it does sound pretty nice. It does sound pretty promising, especially when, though, when both these actors are very good at what they do and they're very respected, uh, especially when just recently uh, on Disney Plus, funny enough, both these actors have been proven to be very beloved by fans, especially with uh, what they have done, rather it be with Owen Wilson playing his character in Loki and now being a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or with um, Rosario Dawson, whom uh, I, I think last year, actually, it's been that long, fudge, uh, last year where she played the role of Ahsoka Tano or the live action Ahsoka Tano in, uh, in The Mandalorian in season two of the Mandalorian. So having these actors, it is a good promise that they will deliver a solid performance for the movie. However, I will say the fact that they have announced that it's those actors, honestly, it makes me a lot more concerned about this movie. And I'm not concerned of the fact that the movie is going to be bad. I'm just concerned that the movie is going to be generic, that it's going to be one of those big budgeted blockbuster movies. You know, the ones made by a major studio that's going to have an all-star cast that is mainly used for the marketing of the feature where the, where the actors are mostly going to be themselves more so than the characters that they actually do play. It's going to have a big budget, a lot of special effects and stuff like that. And it will generally like, it won't be terrible per se, 
but it will mostly be forgotten in the next few weeks or the next few months after its release. That's the part that I'm honestly a little bit worried about, and especially when they do have a lot of recognizable names like Owen Wilson, Rosario Dawson, Tiffany Haddish. Like, already, it, it looks like the cast is mainly going to be consisted of of recognizable celebrities of recognizable stars and not to mention one thing that has concerned uh, that has concerned me ever since the beginning is honestly not really any of the stars but actually the producers that are attached to it dan lynn and jonathan elrich and the thing is with those actor with with those producers again it's not that they're bad producers in fact they've actually made a lot of really good stuff but it's just they're one of those producers that do make those forgettably bland and generic Hollywood movies. And if you do look in their portfolio, like if you do look at what uh, their company, Rideback Productions, has actually done, like, yeah, you do have a lot of really good marks. Like you do see like uh, the, they did the, you know, they produced the Lego movie. They produced the It movies, you know, which are solid. You know, they did Sherlock Holmes as well. But they do have a lot, uh, they do have like a lot of note. Oh, and here's another really good one. The Two Popes. That's another great movie as well. But they've also produced a lot of like lackluster movies. They like either flops or just like generic forgettable crap like Terminator Salvation, for example, or like even some of the later Lego movies like Le Lego Movie 2 or uh, the Lego Ninjago movie, uh, you know, and they were also attached to... Um, the death, you know, they were attached to the Netflix Death Note movie or even working on uh, the Lethal Weapon series, uh, the Lethal Weapon series or, or, or like even currently working on projects that they don't really sound that appealing, such as Avatar, the, the live action Avatar, the live uh, Avatar, the last Airbender series on Netflix or the upcoming Lilo and Stitch remake on, uh, that's coming to Disney Plus. So really, a lot of it is a mixed bag and uh, or even uh, the Aladdin or like another example that they've produced, the Aladdin remake. And I think that's like the big thing that I am concerned about. If they were going to if they're really going to go into the direction that is similar to the Aladdin remake, where really it's a case where they're just going to go and get a bunch of recognizable celebrities to go and work on the movie. And it's just the celebrity being themselves more so than actually playing a character or anything like that and it'll just be generic it'll be quickly forgotten maybe it'll be fun maybe it'll have a few good marks on it but it's just gonna be eh you know it's just gonna be turned into a bland and generic boring hollywood movie and that's it and that's the factor that i'm kind of worried about especially like with what we have recently seen with the jungle cruise movie i mean granted it is a fun movie but there's no denying that it obviously was a bit manufactured like it was pretty much made for the same reasons why disney is still currently making those um those like live action remakes you know like it does have a few good marks but it definitely feels like it's being manufactured and that's the big thing that does concern me with the casting of owen wilson and rosario dawson and tiffany haddish is the fact that disney is manufacturing a haunted mansion reboot more so than actually making a haunted mansion reboot that is just going to be another generic cash grabber and it it's honestly something that disney has been doing for so so long and i mean granted i i, I just want to say this right now that technically being generic it is still better than actually being a bad movie i would still yeah yeah like i know a lot of people criticize illumination for being like um you know for just making a bunch of generic features but then again i would i would gladly take an illumination movie over something like uh norma the north or the emoji movie or most or some of the earlier sony animation films like i would gladly take something like minions any day of the week but in the case of Disney, what makes it problematic is that this is something that Disney has been doing all the time lately, especially with their live action films. Uh, like they, they would just go and take a classic property that they had for a while, for decades, and they would try to go and turn that into a generic big budgeted movie with a bunch of A-list celebrities starring in there. 
I mean, it's not just something that they've done with their live action remakes, but now they're entering in that realm with their theme park rides as well. They've already done so with the Jungle Cruise movie, which actually turned out to be a success. And now they're going to do the same thing with the Mansion movie. The fact that they're bringing in Owen Wilson and Rosario Dawson and probably more recognizable celebrities in there. And that's the part that is honestly concerning. It's not the fact that it's going to be bad. In fact, I think chances are it could actually turn out to be better than the Eddie Murphy movie movie back in 2003 but i'm just worried that this will just turn and they're they're going to take something as iconic as the haunted mansion and they're going to turn that into a generic blockbuster movie but if that would be the case either way the only thing that i do want to ask however is that they like i only wish though is that they just keep the original source material separated from the from the movie itself that they don't do something like pirates of the caribbean and if the mo if this mansion movie does turn out to be a success then suddenly worst case scenario would be like updating the mansion attraction like in the disney parks so that they could go and include all the different celebrities because yeah if there's a yeah because of course if anything is missing in the mansion is that there's a ghost creeping behind you going wow yeah, like that's going to freaking happen. But th that's the only thing I, I am asking, though. And to be fair, to Disney's credit, I will say that they have done a good job so far in keeping the original source material separate from the live action counterpart to not take the live action movie and try to use that to overshadow the original source material. And the great and the best example is actually just recently with what Disney has done with the Jungle Cruise, that they actually kept the attraction and the movie separate. Even when the ride actually had a major update, none of it actually has to do with the movie itself. And if Disney can do that with the Haunted Mansion as well, keep the ride as is and keep the movie as its own thing and like not have them suddenly cross over and suddenly add those updates onto the ride itself, if they can keep them separate, then honestly, that would be fine. That would actually be perfect because honestly, you're going to get a lot, like considering that the mansion does have a pretty prominent fan base. You're going to piss a lot of people off if you're suddenly going to go and try to shoehorn in people like Owen Wilson or Tiffany Haddish onto the ride itself. So I'm just saying. So overall, though, yeah, like honestly, with the casting, it's not the actors themselves that makes me worried. It's the fact that Disney looks like they're manufacturing a mansion movie more so than actually creating a movie. And I feel like the more that I hear about this, the more that I feel like, yeah, they shouldn't have canceled that Guillermo del Toro movie. They should have kept that as is. All right. So with that said, though, I would like to go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about Owen Wilson and Rosario Dawson being attached to the Haunted Mansion movie? Are you guys excited for it? Are you guys highly anticipating for it now? Do you think this is going to be another great hit for Disney? Or do you think this could turn out to be another generic flop like most of the Disney live action remakes? Let me know what you think on all this. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, like forgettable and not that bad. Uh, forgettable and not that bad, or the worst, uh, but not good either is one thing. But if this is one of those movies, yeah, decent. <laughs> let's see now. This movie got me a bit worried because of how this movie would turn out. Some parts of me is saying, okay, and another part of me is stepping back and saying, eh, because I kind of get the feeling it might end up like the Jungle Cruise movie where it's just generic. I don't mind having Owen Wilson and Rosario Dawson in the film, but with the other actors like Lakeith Stanfield and Tiffany Haddish, I don't think they might fit well in the, in the movie. And who do you think might fit well as Madame Liuda? I don't know, honestly. I got the feeling maybe they've already got who they wanted to, because I'm not going to lie. It would not surprise me if they got someone like Tiffany Haddish or even Rosario Dawson, honestly, to play as Madame Liuda. Like, I'm just doing my prediction right now. I think it, it could legitimately be one of those two or more so or, or honestly more so uh, Rosario Dawson. Honestly, I think it could legitimately be her. I think they already got there, Madame Liuda, and it is Rosario Dawson. Uh, let's see now. 
I'm a little concerned that this movie is going to be making the same mistakes as the Eddie Murphy movie, since it seems to be focusing more on comedy than horror. But if we're getting Mobius in this, then does that mean that we're getting a crossover with Loki? Uh, in all seriousness, though, I'm going to need to see a trailer before I decide to see this. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is, is that, uh, honestly, if, if, if we need another Owen Wilson movie in this, y it, it might sound crazy, but, like, like, if you're going to go into a comedy route, then add in the ridiculousness and just freaking put in Lightning McQueen. Why the fridge not have freaking Lightning McQueen appear in a mansion movie? Why not, man? Like, why not? Like, go into the ridiculous level. I mean, the Muppets have already accepted it and they're already getting into that direction already. Why not this movie? You want to bring in Owen Wilson? Bring in freaking Lightning McQueen as well. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, uh, anyways, I mean, like, why, like, or you know what, por que no las dos? Just add in Mobius and freaking Lightning McQueen onto it as well. Uh, anyways, um, let's see what we got here. I actually remember going to the mansion with my family at Disney's Magic Kingdom recently, but I'm sorry I could care less about a mansion movie. It does sound like a soulless product no different from this year's Clifford the Big Red Dog. I'm pretty hesitant for now, so skip. Yeah, I mean, like, right now, it's not very promising with uh, the little information that we have now. Maybe they could prove us wrong, like, when they show us more info or give us more of a narrative and stuff like that. We'll, we'll see. But for now, it's just, I don't know, it's it's heading towards that manufactured direction. Uh, let's see now. Uh, I was at first eh at this uh, mansion news, but the moment you said Owen Wilson, I, ju I, I jumped going... My 15 year old, my 15 year long crush. Yes, yes, yes. I don't care how the movie will be because I want to see him. Uh, I like cars. I apologize for going uh, from intellectual discussion to giddily girl crushing. Also, this wouldn't be the first time Owen Wilson was in uh, a haunted mansion. Thankfully, he won't die because Disney, unless he's a ghost or the villain. Yeah, that's the thing. You got to be aware, though. It's like it. Owen Wilson will be in the attraction. But you never know if they'll give him like spe like you never know if it's just like you see Owen Wilson's face or he could be cast as a ghost similar to like the Hatbox ghost and that pretty little face here yeah that's going to that's going to be deteriorating that's going to be more of a skeleton more so than it is the Owen Wilson you know and love so just be just be careful about that Oh god, and now I'm just imagining Owen Wilson as the hatbox ghost. Like, just suddenly you see the effect where his head suddenly goes in the body. He's like, wow. <laughs> like, or, or that's that's the, that's the sound effect that happens. It's just like anytime his head teleports, like you just hear the wow, wow, wow. <laughs> All right, uh, who, do, who needs Disney to do the casting when we could actually do the casting here ourselves? Okay, um... Uh, let's see who else we got here on one side. I do wish good luck for the movie team. Thank God. It's not Logan Paul instead of Owen Wilson. Yeah, there was no way Disney would cast him again or any or Jake Paul or anything like that uh, for the making of the future remake, hoping that it won't be too chaotic with COVID-19, given that Georgia isn't a very high vaccinated state. But on the other hand, I'm still baffled that you haven't talked about the biggest backlash uh, that concerned a very specific app regarding Disney parks. Hope you'll cover that before Christmas. Yes, okay, honestly, I have yet to fully research this, but I am aware about the backlash and the controversy about Genie Plus. Like, I am definitely aware that, like, it is, t I think it's the replacement of Fast Pass, and it's really not going well. But if there is any other major news that does come up regarding Genie Plus or something like that, then I promise I, I will cover it, okay? Um, if you can help me out to, remi to remind me of that, then that would be helpful. All right, I think I'll go and read one more comment before we uh, get out of this. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? What other comment? Okay, I'll, I'll cap off with this one. My prediction is that the new mansion uh, won't go near as awful as Eddie Murphy as the Eddie Murphy movie, but probably close to that film with how they are making it one of those corporately manufactured. Uh, for the purpose of marketing, I still don't like how Disney. I, I don't. I still don't like how Disney with their live action remakes nowadays. But the news makes me feel like I won't be interested in checking it out even more. Yeah, I mean, let, I mean, for now, let's just hope for the best that we are wrong about this and that maybe this will be more than just like a soulless cash grab. 
But anyways, I'll just say though, if you're not gonna put in, a, if you're not gonna put in soul in something like the haunted mansion, then you're doing something absolutely wrong. And with that said, I think that shall conclude today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. And what a fun-filled episode we had over here. I'm glad that things went well. And I'm glad that you guys had a great time. Or at least I hope you all had a great time. And tune in next week for more fun-filled stories that might pop up in the future. You never know what's going to happen in this podcast. So with all that said, I would like to say thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, see you later, dudes.